While never reaching the same scale either world war reached, the Vietnam War is still an incredibly important subject to talk about. Since its inception, the war was packed full of controversy, and it never let up. The war was also packed full of tragedy, but there were some other things going on too. From sightings of weird animals, the squadrons and flights going missing, to the strangest battle tactics like faking vampire attacks, yeah, we'll get there. The mysteries and obscurities of the Vietnam War iceberg has it all and more. I do want to apologize for the delay in this video. I know, I know, I said January 20th, but I'm going to be straight up and completely honest. This video was insanely depressing to make. There's some evil stuff in this video discussing the following topics. So if that's something you don't want to hear about, you're on the wrong video. Maybe go check out my historical lost media videos. They're great too, I promise. But if you're still here, I'm going to shut up so we can get right into the iceberg, beginning with Tier 1. I think it's only fitting we begin a Vietnam War iceberg with the incident that got America into the war. The Gulf of Tonkin is an area of water in the South China Sea. It connects the Tonkin region of Vietnam to the southern border of China. On August 2nd, 1964, several American warships were in this Gulf, conducting surveillance missions against North Vietnam. While this was going on, the Department of Defense was overseeing South Vietnamese attacks on northern radio towers, bridges, and other military targets. And these began on July 31st. The North responded to these attacks, and they sent torpedo boats after southern vessels. One of America's destroyers, the Maddox, noticed this, and they left. But it returned on August 1st. As they came back, three torpedo boats approached it, and the Maddox fired warning shots. But these boats continued. So the Maddox opened fire. The United States believed that North Vietnam was targeting its intelligence gathering mission. But to North Vietnam, they thought the Maddox had been involved in the raids conducted by South Vietnam. On August 4th, three days after this, massive storms swept through the area, interfering with communications and signaling, and a second report of an attack was sent to Washington. But this attack never happened. Nonetheless, the Lyndon Johnson-led presidency heard what they wanted to hear, and they wanted to hear that North Vietnam attacked America twice. This is the message that was broadcasted to the world and would then lead to America getting involved in the Vietnam War. 58,000 soldiers dead over a miscommunication. Vietnam is a nation full of trees, and the Viet Cong fighters would use this to their advantage, hiding among the forest foliage to stage guerrilla-style attacks on America and South Vietnam. If America and South Vietnam wanted to win this war, they needed to clear some trees. In mid-1961, the South Vietnamese president, Go Dinh Diem, asked the states for help in the task, and in August, the South Vietnam Air Force began dropping a powerful herbicide over the jungles of North Vietnam. By the time the war was over, 20 million gallons of the so-called rainbow herbicides were dropped across Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. In comparison, a 24-foot in diameter, 5-foot tall pool, which is pretty standard, would hold about 2,261 gallons of water if it was filled to the top. This is the equivalent of 8,845 swimming pools full of pesticides dropped across South Asia. In total, 31,000 square kilometers of tropical forest was killed by Agent Orange, an area roughly the size of Maryland, or the size of Belgium. The total amount of pesticides that were used was 20 times the required amount. But the more important effects to study is the human loss experience. In total, over 3 million people were affected by Agent Orange. Estimates rage, but about 300,000 American soldiers and 400,000 Vietnamese have been killed by Agent Orange. It's been reported that upwards of 150,000 children have been born with some form of birth defect as their parents were affected by Agent Orange. American soldiers were told that Agent Orange was harmless to humans, and they were told not to worry. That, of course, was a lie. Since the war ended, many veterans have been diagnosed with ailments related to Agent Orange exposure, including various forms of cancer and diabetes. These are only the reported numbers, and the true extent of the destruction wrought by Agent Orange will never be known. As the war began, and North Vietnam began to face heavy bombing, they went underground. North Vietnam already had some tunnels dug from their previous fights with the French, but the Viet Cong expanded on these systems. A massive complex of tunnels that led into open underground areas were dug. These tunnels served as the soldiers' new homes. They would eat, sleep, and plan down here. Barracks, hospitals, and storage areas were all placed in these underground areas. 
and they were ventilated, allowing for an extended stay. These tunnels were almost impossible to destroy, and this called for a new army position to rise in demand. Tunnel rats. Truly one of the worst orders a soldier could receive. These soldiers would be ordered to climb into the tunnels, to clear them out themselves. The tunnels were very small, only big enough to crawl through. Because of this, soldiers were only equipped with bare bones supplies. They would be given a pistol, a flashlight, and a knife. That was it. Have fun. We're only getting started though. These tunnels were full of non-human threats. Massive snakes, centipedes, and spiders called these tunnels home and provided another obstacle to the soldiers crawling down here. And if that wasn't bad enough, these things were full of booby traps. Some of the tunnels were designed to be easily flooded or filled with poisonous gases. The most famous trap were the punji sticks. These would be pitfalls covered with leaves, and once stepped on, a tunnel rat would fall into sharpened bamboo sticks that were often covered in feces. Other booby traps included tripwires that would bring down boxes of scorpions, pull the pin on grenades, and would even lead to the complete collapse of the tunnels. Thankfully, only about 700 tunnel rats were employed. I know we just talked about the Vietnam War beginning, but now let's discuss its ending, which happened on April 30th, 1975. On this day, the North Vietnamese forces began to amount their final attack on the South Vietnamese capital of Saigon, and at noon that day, a T-54 tank burst through the city's gates. The Vietnam War was over. This photo is probably not only the most famous photo of the fall of Saigon, but is among the most famous photos of the Vietnam War in total. Let's give it some context. Starting on March 29th, 1973, two years before Saigon would fall. On this day, the Vietnam War was over for America. The last American soldier left on this day, leaving the war consisting of North versus South, which would continue for the next few years, but really, the war was over. The North kept taking South Vietnamese cities, and Saigon remained its last bastion. And as this was happening, fears of Saigon being captured rose, and the Vietnamese populace of the city feared a bloodbath once the North got there. So mass evacuations of people began as early as late March and early April. This famous photo was taken on April 29th, 1975, one day before Saigon fell, and depicts several South Vietnamese people trying to board the last helicopter out of Saigon. Over 50,000 people, including American soldiers and personnel, along with South Vietnamese refugees, were evacuated from the city. Soon after, the flag of North Vietnam was raised over the President's palace, and Soon after this, South Vietnam officially surrendered, bringing the Vietnam War to an end. As the Vietnam War raged, Americans soon realized they didn't have enough soldiers to fight their war, so they turned to the draft. This draft was done by a lottery system, in which young men were given a random number that corresponded to their birthdays, and the men with the lower numbers would get called first, entering them into the Vietnam War. Of course, this was met with severe backlash, and several methods were used to get out of selective service. Some filed for a conscientious objector status, which is someone who refuses to carry a weapon by means of morality, ethics, or religious reasons. Think Desmond Doss from Hacksaw Ridge. Some people attempted to claim disability, or in extreme measures, they went AWOL and fled for Canada through secret exits. The draft was hitting college campuses particularly hard, and students banded together in protest to prevent their futures being interrupted by an unjust war. They would hold public draft card burnings, and teachers even got in on the protest inflating the grades of students in an attempt to help them avoid it. The draft loomed heavily over the Vietnam War, and we're going to bring it up several times throughout the iceberg, as it caused and affected several aspects of everyday life. Approximately 1.9 million soldiers were drafted into the Vietnam War, and President Jimmy Carter would issue a presidential pardon to all draft dodgers while he was in office. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was a set of mountains and jungle trails that were used by North Vietnam to transport soldiers and supplies across the nation. The trail was first formed in 1959 and expanded rapidly throughout the next 20 years. By the time the war was over, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was a well-marked set of roads with underground support sites like hospitals and barracks that was supporting well over 100,000 North Vietnamese people. America attempted to stop its use to no avail. This thing stretched for a thousand kilometers, so policing this massive stretch of dense jungle was next to impossible. Some parts of the Ho Chi Minh Trail are still in use today, and some parts were paved to form the nation's modern highways.
The M16 was the main weapon used by American servicemen in the war. It's a semi-automatic rifle that was first made in 1956, but like we said, its popularity and widespread use began with the Vietnam War. The M16 promised the American soldiers a more lightweight and deadlier rifle, but basically the second they were used, reports of problems began to rise. First of all, the rifles were not provided with cleaning kits, so a lot of them became dirty, causing the rifle to perform poorly. The rifle was light, like we said, and one thing not included with the rifle was chrome plating, causing it to corrode in the Vietnamese humid jungles. Finally, the rifle's initial ammunition had a weak propellant, causing the spent casings to not eject properly. These problems were eventually fixed, and the soldiers were properly trained in maintaining their rifles, but not a great start in a war, with plenty more problems to follow. Remember how I said we would be bringing up the draft several times? Here's our second mention of it. Fortunate Son is the anthem of the Vietnam War, coming out in 1969, and since then, has popped up in various medias relating to the Vietnam War, most famously Forrest Gump. But how did this song become the stereotypical Vietnamese war song? Well, it's because it was written to protest the war, and its main message is to stand against people using their prestige to get out of the draft. As the song implies, many senators' sons were taken out of the draft thanks to their parents using their influence. It's the old saying about rich men making war and poor men having to fight them. John Fogertree was quoted as saying in 2015, The song is amazing, and if you've clicked on a Vietnam iceberg without hearing it, go listen to it. John McCain was a United States Senator, runner-up to President, and a Vietnam veteran who was a part of the United States Navy between 1958 and 1981. And we're going to talk about his time in Vietnam as a prisoner of war. Later, we're going to discuss the USS Forrestal Fire, but McCain got his first real taste of life-staking danger here, as he almost perished in the fire. He made it out, but later in the same year, he was participating in Operation Rolling Thunder, which once again, we will discuss later. John McCain's plane was shot down, and he was captured by the North Vietnamese soldiers, and was held as a prisoner of war for six years in the Hanoi Hilton, which, once again, we will discuss later. Man, this is just one big setup entry. John McCain was seriously injured by his plane crashing, but his captors refused to treat him leaving him with fractured arms and one fractured leg. John was tortured and interrogated, and only received care once it was discovered his father was an admiral. In March of 1968, McCain would be moved to solitary confinement, where he would remain for two years. But he had a chance at early release. His father was made commander of all American forces in Vietnam, and the North Vietnamese offered him an early release for a show of goodwill. But McCain refused to go and would only agree to being released if all the prisoners of war would be released. And they were not. Eventually, after five and a half years of torture, disease, and broken bones, John McCain was released on March 14th, 1973. He returned home a celebrity and a hero, and would soon go on to have his very successful political career. But the nightmare he lived would be with him until he died. It's no secret the American populace hated the Vietnam War, and citizens across the country protested the war in various ways. The students at Des Moines Independent Community School District decided to protest in their own way. The students gathered in a home and decided to wear black armbands to school. The principals heard about this plan and issued a statement stating any student wearing the black armbands will be asked to take them off, and if they refused, they would be sent home. Christopher and Mary Beth Pinker would continue with their plans, and on December 16th, they were promptly sent home by the school's administration. The following day, Mary Beth's brother John Tinker would also be sent home after he came to school with a black armband. Their parents were rightfully mad. How could a school punish students for something as simple as wearing a black armband? The parents began a lawsuit against the school system, claiming their children's First Amendment rights were broken. The case went clear to the Supreme Court where a 7-2 decision ruled in favor of Tinker, stating that the Des Moines school did infringe upon their students' right to free speech. And they also stated that schools did not have a right to infringe upon the First Amendment, as long as the First Amendment was not affecting the education of other students. And wearing black armbands clearly did not. The president of South Vietnam, Nguyen Dinh Diem, began the practice of persecuting Buddhists within his country. Dinh himself was a Catholic, which was the minority religion of the nation, as 70-80% to 80 of citizens identified as Buddhist. 
The peak of the persecution occurred on Siddhartha Gautama's birthday, who is the Buddha, and the founder of Buddhism. On this day, the South Vietnamese government banned the flying of the Buddhist flag, leading to wide-scale protests. During one of these protests, Vietnamese soldiers fired into a crowd of Buddhists, killing several. The next day, reporters were notified that something important would be happening at the Cambodian embassy in Saigon, but this message fell on deaf ears. That morning, over 300 Buddhists gathered in a procession to protest, and one of these Buddhists was Thich Quan Duc. Quan Duc stepped from his car with two monks. One of them placed a pillow in an intersection, while the second received a can of gasoline from the trunk. Quan Duc began to meditate on the pillow while he was covered in the gasoline, and then a match was struck, and he was set on fire. He uttered his last words, a plea to the president to end his persecution. But otherwise, he remained completely silent during his incident. A photo was taken, and it exploded in infamy. It brought attention to the situation in Vietnam, and caused the global community to pressure Dim into stopping his persecution, which he didn't. Five months later, Dim would be taken out in a US-backed coup. During the Vietnam War, the American Army used several methods of psychological warfare, and we will be touching on them throughout the iceberg. We're beginning with the most infamous story that's happening, Operation Wandering Soul. Let's set the scene. Imagine you're deep in the woods of Vietnam. You're fighting off Americans who invaded your country. You can't see anything. But you do begin to hear something downright ominous. You hear this. <laughs> That is ghost tape number 10, which would be blasted from speakers strapped to helicopters. In Vietnamese culture, it's said that if your body isn't buried or laid to rest properly, your soul is left to wander the earth. And this is what ghost tape number 10 was attempting to do. The idea was that this tape would cause North Vietnamese soldiers to surrender, fearing they would be met with an untimely death and would also have to roam the earth. The tape also played voice clips of people calling out for help and urging the soldiers to return home from the fight. It wasn't only blasted from helicopters, it was also put on patrol boats as they went up and down the rivers, and special units would sneak behind enemy lines and would play the tape on speakers. Wandering Soul didn't succeed. The Viet Cong knew what it was, and they would simply target the speakers playing the tapes, putting an end to Wandering Soul. Like we mentioned before, college campuses were a hot spot for anti-war protest, and Kent State is among the most infamous stories of this taking place. In the late 60s, several widespread and organized protests began, beginning with the 1966 Kent State Homecoming Parade. Protesters attended wearing military clothing and gas masks. Then in 1968, 250 students organized a sit-in protest against recruiters at the college. But on April 1st, 1969, the protest turned violent as students began to clash with police. As we know, the Vietnam War continued into the 1970s, and President Nixon would expand it into Cambodia. Throughout the next few days, protester activity grew in scale, and at one point reached over 1,200 students in total. The Ohio National Guard, which already had members stationed at Kent State, attempted to disperse the crowd using tear gas. The canisters fell short, and the protest continued. The National Guard then took it a step up, and 96 of them moved forward with their weapons loaded. More tear gas was launched, but the Kent State protest continued. At 1224, Sergeant Myron Pyre had enough. He fired into the crowd of students with his pistol, and several other guardsmen fired their rifles. The shooting lasted a mere 13 seconds, but resulted in three students dead immediately, and another nine would be injured. One student would then pass away at the Robinson Memorial Hospital. The National Guard had no remorse. Some soldiers stated they were fearing for their lives, and that caused them to open fire. Other guardsmen threatened students, telling them they would fire again if they did not disperse. This kicked the anti-war protest into gear, and widespread gatherings broke out all over the country. Over 400 colleges hosted their own protests, and the common sentiment that spread over the students was the message, they can't kill all of us. Five days after the Kent State Massacre, over 100,000 people began a violent protest at Washington, D.C., and the protests on campuses continued. On May 14th, two students would be killed at the Jackson State University as a part of their protest. Back to Kent State. No National Guardsmen were convicted, as they had claimed they fired in self-defense, a testimony that was accepted by the public. May the victims of the Kent State Massacre rest in peace.
On March 16, 1968, 100 American soldiers landed at a village named Son Mai, which the American maps had labeled Mai Lai. They were being led by Captain Ernest Medina. The soldiers expected to find Viet Cong fighters, but they were instead met by old men, women, and children who were simply participating in their daily activities. These citizens were then hurtled into a group, and they were killed. The killing started without warning, and the first citizen killed was a Vietnamese man, who was struck with a bayonet. That same soldier threw another man into a well and dropped a grenade inside. Other groups of citizens were led to mass graves, where they were then killed. Some bodies were mutilated, and the women there faced a worse fate. By the time the killings were over, 300 to 500 citizens were dead. Vietnam List 504 and America List 347. But we have to back up a second. Remember Medina, the guy leading this? He told his soldiers that any civilians would be gone by 7 in the morning, as they would have left to gone to their markets, and anyone left would be a part of the Viet Cong, and they were ordered to kill them. A soldier asked if that included women and children, and Medina said that anyone running from us, hiding from us, or appeared to be the enemy, was to be killed. They were also ordered to pollute the wells and to burn the village afterwards. Back to the actual massacre. Some women pleaded with the soldiers stating they weren't a part of the VC, but the Americans didn't care. They killed indiscriminately. This was covered up. The first initial reporting listed 128 dead Viet Cong and 22 dead civilians, and these civilian kills were stated to have been from artillery fire catching them by accident. It wouldn't be until 1969 when a journalist interviewed a veteran named Rod Rittenhauer, who revealed what really happened at My Lai. 26 soldiers were charged with criminal offenses, but only William Calley, a platoon leader who killed 22 civilians, was convicted. He was given a life sentence, but President Nixon commuted his sentence to three and a half years of house arrest. May the victims of the My Lai Massacre rest in peace. The Green Berets are a group of elite soldiers that served the United States Army. Think like the Navy SEALs, but like we said, berets are for the Army and SEALs are for the Navy. The berets deal with counterterrorism, reconnaissance, hostage rescue, and other high-stakes missions. They were founded on June 19, 1952, and were among some of the first American soldiers to arrive in Vietnam. When they arrived in 1957 to train members of the South Vietnamese Army in counterinsurgency missions against the VC, Within the next 10 years, they ended up assisting 80,000 paramilitary soldiers, recruiting them from remote villages and highlands of Vietnam. In the early hours of April 6, 1967, Douglas Hedgel was knocked into the Gulf of Tonkin by an explosion. He swam to shore, where he was captured by a Vietnamese militiaman, where he was then taken to Hanoi Hilton, a camp we will discuss later. Here, he was tortured for information, but Douglas acted like he was of low intelligence. He claimed to not be able to read or write, and this earned him the nickname The Incredibly Stupid One by the Vietnamese captors. But Douglas was anything but stupid. With the help of a fellow prisoner, Joseph Kreka, Douglas began to memorize the names and personal information of 256 other prisoners. He was able to do this by setting the names to the tune of Old MacDonald Had a Farm. On August 5th, 1969, three prisoners of war would be released by North Vietnam. Although the prisoners came together to not agree with an early release, an exception was made for Douglas because of the intel he had. Once home, he astonished the American officials with this tune, and would go on to talk about the torture he faced at the Noy Hilton during the Paris Peace Talks in 1970. Douglas is still alive, and is still able to recite the names to this day. What a legend. So when he'd ask me, Lieutenant Colonels, I go, Lieutenant Colonels, Crow Jim used in the Mar Gordon, Larson, Robbie Reisner, Strickland, Major Neville Baker, Hal Burns, Jim Jack Moore, Dick, said, Don Burns, Ron Burns, Art Ralph, Fred Trey, Will Gideon, Lurvina, Jim Highshell, Ken U.A., Sam Johnson, Lou Mikowski, Ray Mer Merritt, Al Runyon. I blurted out, you know, my debrief when I got back, he, he, he said, can you slow it down? I said, no, it's like riding a bicycle and you tip over, you know. Do you hate your boss? Do you hate them enough to blow them up? Because several American soldiers did. As the war continued, it decreased in popularity with both American citizens and soldiers. As morale plummeted, soldiers turned their anger to their higher-ups. Soldiers began throwing fragmentation grenades at their superiors to kill them, as the murder weapon would be destroyed after the deed was done, making the tracing of the murder suspect impossible. But these higher-ups would often be warned beforehand, 
Sometimes a grenade would be placed in their sleeping quarters with a pin in, or non-lethal smoke grenades would be thrown in first. But if the officer did not change their ways, they got fragged. The first report of fragging was in 1966, and it continued throughout the entire Vietnam War. In total, nearly 900 soldiers were fragged, and 99 of them ended in death. The Vietnam War caused the record for the most bombed country in the world to happen. And it wasn't even Vietnam, it was Lao. Lao borders Vietnam, and a part of the Ho Chi Minh Trail stretched here. So America began bombing the country to try and disrupt it. In total, 2.7 million tons of explosives were dropped on Europe during World War II. Lao had 260 million bombs dropped on it in total. This is the equivalent of 85,893 bombs being dropped per day, or 3,578 being dropped every hour, or 60 bombs dropped in one minute, or one bomb a second, for 3,000 days. Today, about 75 million, or about 28% of those bombs, remain unexploded. And unfortunately, about 25,000 people have been killed by these unexploded bombs. Today in Laos, many people make their living through these unexploded bombs, turning them in for scrap metal. And now, we discuss one of my favorite musicians, Johnny Cash. I'm worried though, because if I start talking about Johnny Cash, I'll never want to shut up about Johnny Cash. He's my favorite solo musician, and I'm going to be discussing my favorite Johnny Cash song, Man in Black, his anti-Vietnam War song. While Johnny Cash initially supported Richard Nixon's handling of the war, after he expanded into Cambodia, he quickly changed his mind, and would release his Man in Black album a year later. And at the center of it was his song, Man in Black. The song doesn't only voice concerns about the war, he also voices concerns for the disenfranchised, the so-called poor and beaten down. He spoke about drug users, and people who were being over-sentenced, and were being kept in prison due to the littlest of charges. But what the song is best well known for, is his stance against the Vietnam War. Johnny said he wrote the song for the soldiers who are yearning for home, and the ones who are dying it would never make it home. Overall, he felt our involvement was pointless. Three years after Nixon expanded the war into Cambodia, so two years after Man in Black came out, Johnny met with the president, and I love this photo. Johnny looks like he's about to strangle Nixon to death. He doesn't look happy, because he wasn't. Earlier in the day, Cash stood in front of a Senate subcommittee and spoke about the nation's prisons and advocated for widespread prison reforms. Later in the day, Nixon asked Johnny to play at the White House, and he suggested some songs for him to perform, like Okies from Muskogee and Welfare Cadillac. The first one speaks out against protesters, and the second one criticizes people on welfare. Johnny Cash told Nixon, I don't know those songs, but I'll play some of mine. And he performed several songs that were protesting our efforts in the war. The first song he played was What Is Truth, a song with a very blatant anti-war message in the second verse. The next one he played was the aforementioned Man in Black, and he ended his concert with the Ballad of Ira Hayes, a song about the plight of Native Americans, and about the titular Ira Hayes, a Native American veteran who couldn't deal with the guilt of losing his friends during the war, who in turn drunk himself to death. If you're a fan of Johnny Cash, stay tuned, I've got something planned next month. Born in the USA is a song used widely as a patriotic anthem, which is hilarious because Born in the USA is vehemently anti-American. The song was released in 1984, and is about a soldier's journey into the war, and the poor treatment the veterans received once it was over. It begins with a soldier joining the war not because he felt inclined, but he instead did it to avoid jail time. In the war, someone close to him is killed, but the Viet Cong, their perceived enemy, is still alive so it invokes the question of, was it worth it? Once home, the veteran is denied a job, and is basically laughed at the whole time he is home, and the song hits the nail on the head. Vietnam veterans were not treated well. One side of Americans were mad that we lost the war, and the other side was mad that we were over there at all, and this anger from both sides was directed to the veterans coming home, and that's exactly what Born in the USA is about.
On April 29th, 1965, Charles Shelton was shot down over Laos while participating in a reconnaissance mission. He sent out a radio distress reporting how he escaped with his parachute and was requesting pickup. A helicopter was dispatched to retrieve him, but was unable to locate him because of the forest thick foliage. And after this, he disappeared. His wife was alerted that her husband was being held as a prisoner of war, but this wasn't true. No one knows what happened to him, and his wife would unfortunately commit suicide in 1990 due to her grief. Shelton was marked as a prisoner of war until 1994, when he was then marked as killed in action due to the fact he could not be located. He was the last official United States prisoner of war. During the 2004 United States presidential election, a subject of controversy brought up against President George Bush was his service during the Vietnam War. On May 27, 1968, George Bush joined the Texas Air National Guard and committed to six years of service. Two of these years will be dedicated to active duty while training as a pilot and then four years of part-time duty. Bush completed his pilot training in 1970 but never saw active combat. On October 1, 1973, Bush was honorably discharged from the National Guard. And this is where the controversy stems from. That and his attendance were used against him in the 2004 election. It is also claimed that Bush's father pulled strings to keep his son from seeing combat during Vietnam. Alright, we can begin Tier 3 with a reported cryptid sighting during the war. Or we should say, sightings. Throughout the entire Vietnam War, soldiers reported sightings of a species of monkey that ranged in heights between 6 feet all the way up to 7. They had a range of fur collars between red, brown, and black, and they were covered, save for their knees, soles, hands, and face, giving them the appearance of an orangutan. These monkeys were also said to be aggressive, and were said to attack American soldiers that entered their territory. They would throw rocks at the soldiers, which is where the name Rock Ape comes from. And these weren't isolated cases. There are several stories of these things encountering soldiers. There is an area in the Sun Tra Peninsula that American soldiers nicknamed Monkey Mountain, due to how often these things were spotted. So what the hell are we dealing with? Shockingly, I know, but hear me out, they could have been monkeys. 24 different species of monkeys call Vietnam home, so it's likely this is what the soldiers are seeing. But of course, people also claim this was Vietnam's own Bigfoot, and serves to prove the idea and concept of the missing link between our primal ancestors and modern humans. While this story doesn't directly affect the Vietnam War, and it happened about 10 years before the war, it deals with Americans fighting communism in South Asia, and it's a silly story, so let's discuss how the CIA staged vampire attacks. After World War II ended, a group known as the Hukbong Bayan Laban Sahapan, or the People's Army Against Japan, or simply nicknamed the Huk, which is what I'm going to call them, pushed for a more free Philippines, as America was meddling with their elections. Now America wanted to continue to meddle in the elections, so they began to fight the Huk. They didn't want a full-on conflict. America researched the local area's mythology, and they uncovered the Aswang. The Aswang were reported shape-shifting cannibal creatures, and America faked attacks from them to scare away the Huck. CIA operatives would kidnap Huck fighters, kill them, drain them of their blood, and would leave their bodies behind to be found. This rightfully scared the Huck, and I don't blame them. I would be pretty scared too if I found my friend drained of blood and dead. The Huck soon left the area, helping America in their fight against them. Here's a historical butterfly effect for you. A president ignores a letter that later gets over 3 million people killed. The man writing this letter was Ho Chi Minh. The man who ignored the letter was Woodrow Wilson. We're going back to World War I, when Woodrow Wilson was a part of an Allied Forces meeting that was discussing peace terms for the defeated countries. Previously, Wilson had outlined his 14 points of declaration, and one of these points called for self-determination of all people. Now, Vietnam at this time was a French colony, so Ho Chi Minh reached out to Wilson in an attempt to negotiate their independence. Wilson ignored this. But this wasn't the only president to ignore a letter that could have prevented the Vietnam War, because Harry Truman did the same thing. 
Once again, this was a letter calling for Vietnamese independence, and once again, it fell on deaf ears. On May 2nd, 1966, Jeremiah Denton was forced by North Vietnam to give an interview about his captivity. He was a rear admiral, one of the highest ranked prisoners of war, so he was forced to be broadcasted. After answering questions in favor of the American government, Denton was taken away. But something was off. The tape was studied by US Naval Intelligence, and they noticed Denton was blinking rapidly. They quickly deduced he was blinking in Morse code, and his message was translated. Torture. One unspoken word told Americans everything they needed to know. American POWs were being tortured. Denton was released in 1973 and went on to have a successful career in politics. There is a story of America dropping extra large condoms, labeled as small, over their enemies' lands in an attempt to make them feel inadequate, Frank Reynolds style. In doing research for this entry, I've read it was used during World War II, used on Russia during the Cold War, and then again on North Vietnamese forces, but which one of these is true? One story says the CIA planned to do this, but they didn't. There are stories of soldiers putting condoms over the muzzle of their guns to prevent dirt from getting inside of it, but the condom drop story seems to be a myth, or an urban legend, or simply an idea that never went into fruition. On July 31st, 2018, a piece of lost media was discovered in full. A short film known as Short Subject, or what is more commonly referred to as Mickey in Vietnam. The film was made by Milton Glasser and Whitney Lee Savage, Adam Savage's father. It features Mickey Mouse volunteering for military service, only to be killed moments after stepping off the boat in Vietnam. Whitney and Savage claimed they used Mickey because he was a symbol of innocence, my how times change, and was overall expressing protests against the war and calling for it to seize. The film was first shown at the International Short Film Festival in Obenhauser, Germany in 1970, and it was later shown at such events. Its first upload on YouTube came on April 22, 2013, but the full version with sound was uploaded five years later, allowing us to view this piece of lost media history. In a war of major escalations, the Tet Offensive may be the largest, and was one of the largest battles in total. The attack began on the morning of July 31st, 1968, which was the Vietnamese New Year, a holiday known as Tet Nguyen Dan, which is where the name Tet Offensive comes from. That morning, five major cities, tons of military bases, and other small villages scattered throughout South Vietnam were attacked. At first, these VC attacks were successful, and they actually held parts of Saigon, the capital, but they quickly realized they should have stuck to guerrilla warfare, as they began to suffer heavy casualties. Overall, the Tet Offensive was a North Vietnam loss. Their goal was of course to defeat and capture South Vietnam, but they also wanted to cause the United States to back off, and to inspire more South Vietnamese civilians to rebel. Both of these goals failed. The Ace of Spades is the most famous card in a deck, and was used widely during the Vietnam War. After killing a member of the Viet Cong, American soldiers would leave an Ace of Spades on the body. It was their belief that the Vietnamese locals feared the Ace of Spades, as the Americans wrongfully believed that it was a symbol of death to the locals. In 1966, American soldiers made a special request to a card company to receive 3,000 decks of card made entirely of the Ace of Spades, and the card company obliged and did it free of charge. While you might not know the name Nguyen Noc Lone, you definitely know this photo. This photo was taken on February 1st, 1968, and shows Nguyen about to execute a Viet Cong fighter. This took place in Saigon during the Tet Offensive. The man who was executed was Nguyen Van Lam, and was a Viet Cong captain. He was captured during the fight and was brought to Lone, who did not hesitate to execute him. A few months after this, he was seriously injured by machine gun fire, and would bounce around the planet receiving medical care, but his leg never fully healed, and would be amputated in September of 1974. We're now in 75, and Saigon was falling. Lone approached the US Embassy to be evacuated, and after approaching several different planes, he was taken into the United States, 
where he moved to Dale City, Virginia, and continued to live the rest of his life in peace, opening a restaurant that specialized in burgers, pizza, and Vietnamese cuisine. In 1991, Lone closed his pizzeria. On the last day of owning his establishment, he went to the bathroom and saw a sign carved into one of the doors, We know who you are, fucker. He would pass away from cancer eight years after this. The USS Forrestal was a United States carrier named after the first United States Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal. The ship was built in 1955 and was used in the Vietnam War. It left Norfolk, Virginia in June of 1967 and arrived in the Gulf of Tonkin on July 25th. Four days later, a rocket was accidentally fired and struck a station jet that was about to take off. As we mentioned, John McCain was piloting this plane. The jet exploded, and this caused a series of explosions to go off that killed 134 sailors and injured an additional 161. When discussing the brutality of the Vietnam War, Hamburger Hill should be a staple in the conversation. Hamburger Hill, or Hill 937, was a peak in the dense jungles of the Shao Valley in Vietnam. Since it was so close to the Laotian border, it was a critical point the United States wanted to capture. But this hill wasn't going to be taken easily, as North Vietnam was heavily entrenched on it. On May 10th, 1969, America began to attack the hill, but they were making little progress, and they were taking a lot of casualties. Machine gun fire and artillery strikes were wiping out American soldiers, and the infamous name of the Hamburger Hill soon arose. Several soldiers who were asked about the area said it looked like they were in the inside of a hamburger machine, implying that their fellow soldiers had been cut down to Hamburger. Despite this, Hamburger Hill was captured, but was abandoned less than a week later. And less than one month after this, North Vietnam regained control. We've touched on the sheer amount of bombs dropped during the Vietnam War with the mass bombing of Lao and how the tunnels were made as a response. But now we can continue the discussion with Operation Menu. This was a United States bombing campaign that affected eastern Cambodia. The United States was targeting the bases of the Viet Cong and the Khmer Rouge guerrillas. Operation Menu earned its spot on the iceberg thanks to the fact it was the first time the B-52 Super Fortress bombers were used, an iconic symbol of America's way over budget military force. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was the lifeblood of the Viet Cong, and America tried to stop the routes using the traditional ways of bombing it and patrolling it, but it was simply way too big for any of these methods to be successful. So America turned to a non-traditional method to destroy it. Throughout the months of June and October, Vietnam faces its monsoon season, which sees heavy rain hitting the country, and America made an attempt to extend its monsoon season by dropping lead and silver iodide into the atmosphere to generate rain clouds, extending the monsoon season. The idea was to soften the dirt trail to the Ho Chi Minh Trail so that they would be harder to traverse and landslides would happen among them. The slogan of this operation was make mud, not war, and mud was made. It began in March of 67, and happened every raining season through 72, so for five years. America had very little allies in the Vietnam War, but one I didn't know about, and by far the largest supporter base we had, was South Korea. South Korea and America were already tight due to the support they received during the Korean War and South Korea wanted to pay the Americans back by supporting their war efforts in Vietnam. They also did this so that America would continue to help support them against the North Korea attack. The first South Korean soldiers arrived in Vietnam in 1964 and took on a more background role, serving as engineers and doctors. This would soon change, as combat operatives would soon arrive, and they quickly gained a reputation. South Korean soldiers were heavily trained and disciplined, maybe more so than America's own. One big difference was the fact South Korea trained their soldiers in extensive Taekwondo to give them an edge in hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. South Korea was also vehemently anti-communist, more so than America, thanks to the Korean War, which they had fought communist North Korea. So now they were taking their anger out on the communist North of Vietnam. Within the first year of being there, 2,000 VC were killed compared to the under 300 South Koreans killed. South Korea participated in their own war crimes as well, killing over 9,000 Vietnamese civilians in their efforts. 
and they were responsible for the leveling of several villages. Overall, a terrifying force that VC avoided. Have you seen this photo before? This is, allegedly, a massive 100-foot snake that was photographed from the sky. There are two different stories of where this photo was taken. The first one states it was taken in the Congo in 1959, and then again it was taken in 64 in Vietnam. The photo is more attached to the Congo story, and it said that Colonel Remy Van Lierde circled the snake, had this photo taken, only to then see the snake rise high into the air, high enough to strike the helicopter if it wanted to, so they left it alone. The snake was estimated to be 50 feet in length, and was said to be shades of brown and green with a white belly. There's a story very similar to this, where a helicopter is photographing trail lines in the woods, and the crew saw something slithering around. They approached it and saw a massive snake head pop through the trees, and of course they fled. It was reported that the snake's head was as big as a horse, and its eyes were almost 3 feet in diameter. Both of these stories are shaky, but the Vietnam War one is more so. Listen, I love cryptids, I've loved them since I was a kid, and I want to believe this. But seeing is believing, and this is the only thing I saw about this. I tried to find the documentary mentioned here, and I can't. Ooh, lost media, ooh. Now let's back up to the Congo story, though. The absolute largest snake in Africa is the Rocky Python, and they have been measured to be 50 feet, but the snake Remy saw was twice as large. As we mentioned, the snake was shades of dark brown and green with a white belly. The Rocky Python is more black and brown, but does have a white belly, like the massive snake. But then there's that word, massive. That's part of the reason why old species died out. They were too big to feed themselves, so they died. Big things like this don't exist because they need to eat a lot. But while we're on it, let's talk about the Titan Boa. This massive extinct species of snake that grew up to 49 feet in length. So this theory is that this snake is a leftover Titan Boa. Okay, I've spent enough time on this nonsense. Great story, fun story, I want it to be real, but come on guys. And here we are. We've mentioned the mysterious Hanoi Hilton several times throughout the iceberg, and now we get to actually discuss what it was. The Holo Prison, which, first of all, translates to Fiery Furnace, so that should give you an idea of what we're about to get into, was located in Hanoi, and was first used by the French to hold political prisoners. It was later used by North Vietnam to hold American prisoners of war, in which the first one sent there was Everett Alvarez Jr., an American pilot who was shot down on August 5th, 1964. The Hanoi Hilton was anything but its hotel name counterpart, as it was brutal. We can start to discuss its brutality by looking at this picture of a cell in the jail. Their bed was a concrete slab, but this was the least of the prisoners' worries. The prisoners here were tortured for information. They would be stretched out until the victims felt their ribs begin to pull apart. Soldiers were also starved, and the whole place was of course unsanitary, causing disease to run rampant. In 1969, Ho Chi Minh died, and the torture here ceased immediately. The North then switches propaganda to make it seem like Hanoi Hilton was more like a summer camp. Then four years later, Hanoi Hilton would open its doors, allowing the POWs to leave as a part of Operation Homecoming. Ho Lo continued to serve as a prison, but would have most of its buildings tore down in the mid-1990s. The remaining part of the prison is now a museum, showing off the conditions of the prisoners living here. You know, we could have been out of Vietnam a lot sooner, but part of the prolonged warfare can be blamed on Richard Nixon. Of course, he expanded the war into Cambodia, continuing it there, but we can blame him for extending the war during his Senate days. As the 1968 election approached, peace talks between America and the two sides of Vietnam were taking place, and it seems certain Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, would secure a peace deal. But on the day before Democratic nominee Hubert Humphrey and Republican nominee Richard Nixon will be debating. These peace talks ceased. Why did this happen? They were on the verge of closing out a peace deal, and it suddenly stopped. And it's because Richard Nixon ordered it to stop. Like we said, the Democrat-led presidency was about to secure a peace deal, and this gave Humphrey a huge boost in the polls. And Nixon knew it was going to be a close race, or even a loss. Nixon had a communication line into Saigon through Anna Chenault, and he had her tell the South Vietnam government that Nixon would secure them a better peace deal if he were to be elected. South Vietnam believed him, and they dragged their feet through their negotiating process. This made LBJ mad. Very mad. Mad enough to accuse Nixon of treason, which is absolutely what he did. But Nixon denied it through his entire life. 
Years after he died, the smoking gun letters will reveal that yes, Richard Nixon in fact stalled peace talks so that he could be elected. Richard Fitzgibbon Jr. was the first American soldier to be killed in the Vietnam War, and he was killed by another American soldier. His murder happened on June 8, 1958, and was perpetrated by Edward Clark, and this wasn't an accident. He very much intended to kill Fitzgibbon. The two were pilots, and allegedly Fitzgibbon reprimanded Clark for a mistake he made. And later in the night, Clark got heavily drunk and exited to see Richard on the street. So Clark pulled out his pistol and shot him several times. He then fled the scene and exchanged fire with the Vietnamese police chasing him. He then rather fell or jumped off a two-story building and died. Yes, you heard that entire story correctly. This dude probably got told he took a landing too fast, took it so to heart that he got wasted, and shot that man dead later in the night, only to then run from the police and end up dead himself. The Vietnam War almost ended a couple of times, and we just discussed how Richard Nixon sabotaged peace attempts, but now we can discuss Operation Marigold. This was an attempt to broker peace, and was carried out through communication with a Polish diplomat, Jesus Christ, Yanez Lewandowski, and then an Italian ambassador, Giovanni Dorlandi, and then the US ambassador, Henry Cabot Lodge. Talks were beginning, but were quickly dropped once the continued bombing of Hanoi occurred. Lyndon Johnson was warned that peace talks were taking place, but he didn't care. He authorized the bombings, and Marigold died on December 30th, 1966. Rolling Thunder was another mass bombing campaign carried out by the United States against Vietnam, China, and North Korea. Their goals was to take out the enemy from the sky, without the need to send in soldiers. To be more specific, there were four goals outlined boosting the morale of Saigon, destroying the air defenses of North Vietnam, halt the flow of soldiers and material into the country, and overall, as we said, end the war without sending in soldiers. As we know, this failed, despite the heavy and vast amounts of ordnance fired. The Phoenix program was an operation led by America's CIA to identify and destroy the VC through infiltrations, assassinations, torture, and counterterrorism. But the Phoenix program was quickly pointing fingers and guns at thousands of people in South Vietnam who were thought to be a part of the VC. By the time the Phoenix program was discontinued, 26 to 46,000 people had been killed. And the estimates also ranged on how many people killed were a part of the VC and what percent were just innocent civilians. If you remember the My Lai Massacre, it was one effort a part of the Phoenix program, and nobody killed there was a part of the VC. The Phoenix program has also been criticized for its brutality, as members often tortured people who were suspected to be part of the VC. People being starved were some of the least brutal methods used, as some of the things America did were truly deplorable and disgusting. Out of the 58,000 American soldiers killed in Vietnam, nearly one-fifth of them were under 20 years old, and Dan Bullock was a part of this crowd. However, Dan wasn't 19, he wasn't 18, he wasn't 17. My friends, Dan Bullock was 15 years old when he was killed during the Vietnam War. So now let's figure out how and why a 15-year-old was killed in Vietnam. When Dan was 14, he edited his birth certificate to say he was born four years earlier than what he really was. So he went through and joined the United States Marine on September 18, 1968. He would be in South Vietnam seven months later and would be killed less than another month later. He and three other Marines were in a hangar when a North Vietnamese soldier threw a satchel charge inside. He and the two other Marines were killed. Dan's grave wasn't even marked until the year 2000. It wouldn't be a major conflict without legendary snipers with iconic names. And the most iconic sniper of the Vietnam War has got to be Carlos Hathcock, or as the North called him, the White Feather, because he kept a white feather in his helmet. Before Carlos even stepped foot in Vietnam, he was already a marksman, winning several shooting contests at home and at his military base. He quickly continued to prove his skills, killing between 300 to 400 North Vietnamese soldiers. He only has 93 confirmed kills though, as back then, the sniper's spotter had to be the one to confirm the kill, and snipers were often without one. 
The North quickly made note of this mystery sniper killing so many of their numbers, so a bounty of $30,000 was placed on his head. Bounties on snipers were nothing new, but the previous high was $2,000. So the hunt for White Feather began, but America wasn't going to lose their prize sniper that easily. Every American sniper was ordered to place a White Feather on their helmet to make confirmation of the real White Feather impossible. There's two infamous stories of White Feather I want to cover. The first one involved a duel between him and a North Vietnamese sniper known as the Cobra, who had already taken out several Marines and was believed to have been dispatched to take out Carlos himself. Carlos spotted the glint of something in a bush and fired. His bullet went through the Cobra's scope and through his eye, killing him. His other story is even more famous. Hathcock was given a mission to kill a Northern general, so he took the feather out of his hat the only time he would do so and began to crawl towards the target. For four days, he crawled inch by inch until he made it to his target. He recalled being so hidden that an enemy almost stepped on him and was almost bitten by a deadly bamboo viper. But Hathcock made it to his target, took him out with a single shot, and crawled back, all without ever being detected. Hathcock soon retired from sniping after this, but taught other soldiers to snipe before passing away in 1999. We're beginning tier 5 with another weird creature that was allegedly spotted during the war, and that's the massive spiders of Vietnam. I'm a horrible arachnophobe, and I hated every second of writing and researching this, and I'm sure I'm going to hate editing it, but the show must go on. The first report of a massive spider in Vietnam comes from a user on the Crypto Mundo forum, named Mr. Maxima, who's retelling a story from their stepfather, a Vietnam veteran. The veteran claimed he was a part of a five-man scout crew and were deep into the jungles of the nation. There, the crew encountered what can only be described as a massive spider. They were said to have bodies as big as dinner plates, and their total length was anywhere from 20 to 30 inches. These spiders were also said to have been found along various water sources, like creeks and lakes. Most bizarrely, the stepfather claimed that even after the soldiers unloaded their M16s into them, the spiders still moved around. So where to begin? We've got a long game of telephone that starts on a cryptid blog that looks like it hasn't been updated since 2001. I'm not buying it, but a researcher named Carl Shooker has, and is researching the story trying to prove whether or not this happened. There are three main species of spiders that live in Vietnam. The grass cross spider, the giant golden orb weaver, I'm getting cold chills just writing this story by the way, I fucking hate spiders, and the batik golden web spider. The biggest one of these is the Golden Orb Weaver, but the female of this species only grows up to 6 inches in length, a far cry from 20 to 30. But what about a species not native to Vietnam? Behold, coconut crabs! These things are massive, and they're spider-like, so it's possible the veterans saw these things, but they're not native to Vietnam. Here's their nativity, and here's Vietnam. But here's the catch. Adult coconut crabs cannot swim, they will drown. So it's very unlikely one ended up that far away, but larval coconut crabs can swim. But that far? I don't know, man. But you know what is likely? This is a lie. A story told to this Mr. Maxima in an attempt to scare him. But that's up to Carl Shooker to decide, and I hope he finds nothing, because I hate spiders, and I'm done talking about them. Let's move on. Fans of my World War II iceberg will remember the Axis Sallies in Tokyo Rose. Women who would broadcast from Axis channels to Allied soldiers, taunting them and trying to get them to surrender. North Vietnam had their own version of this with Hanoi Hanna. Trina Thai Go would broadcast three times a day, and would list off the names of newly killed or captured Americans, and would play American music over the radio, attempting to make the soldiers homesick. She would also list the exact positions of United States battleships and the crew inside, stating they were all going to die. G.I., your government has abandoned you. They have ordered you to die, G.I. Do not trust them. Defect, G.I. It is a very good idea to leave a sinking ship. You know you cannot win this war. Hanoi Hanna had very little effect on Americans although it's been stated that soldiers were impressed by the fact she got their positions correct. For the rest of her life, Go stated she wholeheartedly stood by the reports she would read and felt America's involvement in the war was unjust.
On May 9th, 1970, several students were protesting at the Lincoln Memorial against Richard Nixon's expansion of the war into Cambodia. Nixon woke up at 4 in the morning and saw the massive gatherings of people and decided to go down and talk to them. He spoke to a lot of the protesters and was kind of ranting and raving like a madman, which was typical for Nixon. He encouraged the people there to travel the world while they were so young, and he discussed their university's football teams. But no one was there for small talk. They were mad and were expressing their anger to the president, causing the Secret Service to worry about his safety. So Nixon soon left. Not before a massive, hairy man ran towards Nixon and asked for a photograph to which he obliged. Bob Mustax was the so-called hairy man and later claimed to be high on LSD during this encounter. Some of the students were interviewed about their talks with the president and they claimed he had absolutely no sentence structure when he spoke. As we've mentioned, America found it harder and harder to get soldiers for their war cause. It was an unpopular war, and the draft only made it more unpopular. So the Department of Defense began a new plan, Project 100,000. This was a plan to recruit soldiers who had previously failed military intelligence tests into the war effort, and the name comes from the fact that their numerical goal was 100,000 persons. This went by other names, and the more commonly used one was McNamara's Morons, named after the Defense Secretary Robert McNamara. The project also targeted poor applicants, waving the dollar signs in their face to goad them into going to war. Project 100K overexceeded its goals by three times, recruiting 350,000 people to go to war. It immediately was a mess, as the soldiers of Project 100K began to die more disproportionately than others. Half of these soldiers went to combat roles, and by the time the war was over, about 5,500 of them died. Which doesn't sound like a lot at first, but this is three times the rate of other American soldiers killed. There are 1,200 missing American soldiers from Vietnam, but what's more mysterious is the disappearance of three American civilians in the war. Archie Mitchell, Daniel Gerber, and Eleanor Ardell Vietti. These three were on a mission trip to South Vietnam, where they would treat cases of leprosy that were beginning to spread. On May 30th, 1962, the three were kidnapped by Viet Cong guerrillas from their leprosy colony, and this was the last time they were ever seen. It's been said they were kidnapped to perform medical care for Viet Cong soldiers, but like we said, this is the last time they were ever seen, and were marked presumed dead in 1991. On May 12, 1975, the Khmer Rouge seized an American container ship, the SS Mayaguez, while it was sailing to Thailand. A sailor on the ship broadcast in a mayday, and it was picked up in Jakarta, Indonesia, so the U.S. Embassy there was alerted. Aircraft in the Philippines and Indonesia were dispatched to find the Mayaguez, and it didn't take long until the seized vessel was discovered. It was at an island 30 miles away from the Cambodian mainland. Once diplomatic means of ending the conflict failed, a more aggressive method was put into place. U.S. Marines boarded the Mayaguez while another group landed on the island. The Mayaguez was found to be abandoned, so all efforts were put onto the landing on the beach, and it was a mess. Three out of the five helicopters landing there were shot down, and before the conflict was over, an additional five were destroyed. Three hours after this mess, a fishing boat waving the white flag approached the Americans, and on board was the crew of the Mayaguez. They were peacefully returned, and they revealed they weren't harmed. A little bit before this, a message from Cambodia revealed that this was simply an investigation of a foreign boat in their waters that triggered into a bigger mess. Sixteen hundred American soldiers never made it home from Vietnam, and Robert Borton is one of them. Well, he is if you ask the American government, but if you ask his family, he's visited them several times. Robert was 19 when he arrived in Vietnam, and 19 days after he made it, he disappeared. Two veterans arrived at the Bortons and alerted them that their son was missing in action. They waited and prayed for any news, but none would come. Two years later, the Bortons were browsing through a marine magazine they were subscribed to, and Wanda Borton was looking down at her son. They took it to the marine casualty office and asked for confirmation, but they weren't given any good news. They were told it wasn't their son. Later, the Bortons were watching a 16mm film of a Vietnamese prison, and again, they saw their son. 
But yet again, the Marines said they spoke to every one of the prisoners in the video, and none of them were Robert Borton. Allegedly after this, two men approached Robert's dad on several occasions and asked for him to change his status to kill in action, and his dad refused, until the men asked him to do it for his son's safety. His dad obliged and had his son's status change. The father was still not satisfied with this, and they continued to dig into it. Robert's sister, Diane, her cousin worked at a security company that often ran credit checks, and at Diane's request, he ran Robert's credit. But his number was stated to never have been issued, and after this, his cousin claimed that he was followed by a man, called by name, and was ordered to forget about what he saw. In 1990, Diane moved to Washington, D.C., and she was at a gas station when she saw a man filling up a red car. That man was her brother. He was leaving, so she didn't have a chance to talk to him. A month later, a red car pulled up beside of her, and a man was driving it, her brother. He smiled at her and drove away, turning down a road to Quantico Military Base. Diane was able to get the license number that was traced back to a car in Virginia, and the driver had no idea who Robert was. Overall, I think the story is that of a family seeking closure, and was trying to find their loved one through any means necessary. As for the whole being followed thing, I don't know man, I'm reading off some ugly form, I'm not seeing any sources on this. But, on the form was this. This random guy claimed to have been scuba diving in Gaylord, Michigan when he found this. This is a band made specifically for missing in action veterans. So what was it doing at some lake in Michigan? Is there more to the story? And do you guys want to follow up on this? A video fully dedicated to the story? I'm definitely interested in this, so if you are too, let me know. March 15th, 1962. The first day of combat in Vietnam for American soldiers. And Flight 739 was bringing American soldiers over to fight. The plane left Travis Air Force Base in California and had Ford planned refueling stops. The first one was in Hawaii, the next one was on an island airfield, then in Guam, and then the final one was in the Philippines. The plane made it to Guam alright, and refueled, and they set off for the final refueling spot. The plane had enough fuel for a 9 hour flight, and this trip was only going to take 8. The plane radioed 80 minutes after taking off, giving a routine message about their position. This took place at 1422 GMT, and the plane was supposed to land an hour and 8 minutes later. At 1529, 9 minutes after it was supposed to land, a radio operator in Guam contacted Flight 739 and received no response. The aircraft was lost and was never seen again. The plane was declared missing in the morning of March 16th, and the Navy, Coast Guard, and Marines searched Guam. In the first day of investigation, 190,000 square kilometers of ocean was searched, and nothing was found. The search expanded to Okinawa, Japan. But after eight days of searching, which now stretched over 500,000 square kilometers of ocean, it was called off. Flight 739 was gone. Flight 739 was a part of a flight line, and two other flights inside of it had their engines screwed with, prompting people to believe that 739 faced the same issue. So this will make sense, but of course, it's not a tan man iceberg if we don't discuss the bizarre theories. A Liberian tanker was in the area where Flight 739 was expected to be, and they had reported a bright light in the sky. And this report was made about an hour and a half after 739's last contact. The captain of the tanker went on to say that they saw two red fireballs fall into the ocean. But again, that area was searched and nothing was found. We've mentioned the heavy bombing so many times, but these weren't the only weapons dropped from planes in mass amounts. Behold, the lazy dog. These things were only about 2 inches in length, and weighed about 20 grams in total. They were designed to be dropped from planes like we said, but had absolutely no form of explosive. They were simply kinetic weapons and would use gravity to penetrate through the thick foliage on anyone hiding below. The reports of the lazy dog say they fell at speeds of 700 meters per second, which I think, I don't know, I didn't ever take physics, gives us 14,000 newtons in force, which is powerful. We've discussed how America tried to monitor the Ho Chi Minh Trail to little avail. They simply couldn't spare the manpower to constantly watch this massive set of roads, but they could leave transmitters along the trail, designed to report the movements of soldiers. 
But if these transmitters were spotted, of course they'd be destroyed. So they had to be hidden. And America would hide them by molding a shape that resembled poop. And then they would place the transmitter inside of it, keeping it hidden so that the Ho Chi Minh Trail could be monitored. Here's another effort of cutting down Vietnam's foliage. This time it was in the form of a 15,000 pound bomb that would be dropped off a parachute and would explode right before it hit the ground, clearing a radius mostly so that a helicopter could land. The radius cleared was around 500 feet in total. These bombs were also used during the Gulf War. In a one report, a British soldier saw the powerful blast and mushroom cloud that was created and reported back to their headquarters in a panic stating, Sir, the blokes have just nuked Kuwait. We're going clear back to the Gulf of Tonkin incident for this one. More specifically, the second incident. This is the one that didn't happen. Due to a misreading of technology, a report of a second attack was sent out, but like we said, this didn't happen. But what did happen? What happened to cause the United States destroyer ship to believe they were under attack for four hours? Sailors on the Turner Joy reported seeing torpedoes on the ship's sonar, or what they thought were torpedoes, because they were moving weirdly and the Turner Joy never experienced any damage. So what was on the sonar? Giant pyrosomes. These are invertebrates that travel in a colony and flash a light when disturbed. They also float to the top of a surface and show up on a sonar. And yes, they live in the waters of Vietnam, so it's possible these harmless sea invertebrates caused the death of a couple million people. In the very late hours on a particular night, August of 1969, Earl Morrison and others were on the lookout for the enemy, but the night was quiet. Now, police and nurses watching this, they know, as soon as you say that dreaded Q word, the job becomes the opposite, which is exactly what happened. At about 1.30 in the morning, Morrison spotted something in the sky. It was a winged creature, with the body of a naked woman, but she was solid black, like a flying winged shadow. The creature got closer, about 10 feet away from the soldiers, before it took off into the night. Earl brought this up with the locals, who were terrified. They mentioned tales of this creature, and how they would often swoop men away to be eaten. Robert was rightfully terrified, and he kept the story to himself for years, before coming out and revealing it. Look man, it was the 60s, a period marked by an increase in narcotic use. And it was very late. But sure, this naked bird woman came down and almost took this dude. The United States Marines would often recruit Vietnamese locals to help them guide them through the jungles, and a common warning soon appeared. Watch out for the Ma. The locals described them as reanimated corpses that stalked the trees. The Marines shrugged this off, but allegedly encountered them in 1965. I'm gonna stop right there. When I made this iceberg, I was looking for mysteries and ghost stories and whatever else I could find on this website. I read this story and assumed it was more widespread and just put it on the iceberg at the very bottom without thinking about it, but now I can't find any mention of this anywhere else. As far as I can tell, this website made it up. Sorry for wasting your time. On November 18th, 1968, a Pennsylvania state trooper was driving down the road when he noticed a man sitting on the side. He pulled over and discovered that this man was dead stabbed through the heart. This sparked a nearly 50 year long mystery that was finally solved in 2012, when the body was identified as Robert Daniel Corval. Robert had previously done two tours in Vietnam and received three Purple Hearts for his bravery. He was now being treated at the Philadelphia Medical Center for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. Robert then disappeared and was thought he had fled the hospital. Little to anyone's knowledge, his body was found four hours after this but wouldn't be identified for another 40 years. Robert was previously marked as a coward and a deserter, but received his proper respect after his body was found. So well good and all, we found Robert, but what happened in those four hours where he left the hospital to the time he was found stabbed? Well, no one knows, and we only have conspiracies. Robert's mom believes he was murdered by his fellow soldiers out of jealousy and was dumped along the street. Others believe he fled the hospital and was killed by a hitchhiker, but no one knows, and it's likely we never will. On the night of June 16, 1968, 
The United States Marines reported strange lights in the sky near the DMZ, headed towards Tiger Island. This was the only activity reported until PCF-19 suddenly exploded. It was said that two rockets hit this boat, killing five of its crew. The remaining crew clung to a life raft and were later picked up, but the states had an enemy aircraft to deal with. Another boat requested permission to engage the aircraft, but the United States Command could not identify the aircraft in the sky, whether it was one of their own or an enemy. The aircraft opened fire, and there were no other friendlies reported in the area, so PCF-12 opened fire. PCF-12 soon reported that a helicopter was down and crashed into the water, and the fighting soon ceased after this. The reason it's on the iceberg is because, of course, when people hear weird lights in the sky, they immediately think of aliens. Trinh Minh Thế was a Vietnamese militia leader during the First Indochina War and later the Vietnam War. His forces- what the hell was I trying to write? His forces were eventually added to South Vietnam's own military, and Thế became a general. At this point, Go Dinh Diem was still leading South Vietnam and was becoming incredibly more unpopular, and several militia leaders were planning to go against the president. However, they showed no signs of opposition. But on May 3rd, 1955, Thay was standing peacefully beside his military jeep when he was suddenly shot in the head. Nearly 70 years later, we have no idea who did this. Theories range, and the most believable one is that the South Vietnamese government did this out of paranoia that he would soon rebel against the president. We have another missing plane. Baron 52 was shot down over Laos on February 5th, 1972, a week after the Paris Peace Accords brought America out of the war. The plane was carrying eight crew members, but only four bodies were recovered at the crash site. Officially, there is no answer to what happened to the other four, but the family believed they were captured by North Vietnamese soldiers. On February 5th, the day the plane crashed, a North Vietnamese communication stated that four airmen were being escorted. And this wasn't the only message like this. Throughout the next three months, reports of four airmen captured on February 5th being moved were revealed. Baron 52 was the only plane downed on this day. So case closed, right? Well, not exactly, as some details around this are strange. It was reported by a colonist on Good Morning America that these messages were given to the family were simply misinformation. The story picks back up in 1992, when an investigation of the crash site was launched, and 23 bone fragments were observed, and these remains were proven to be a part of the four missing airmen. So case closed, right? Again, not really. As the families came together to request DNA analyses to be done on the fragments, to which the government denied performing them, the families continued to press for information, but nothing else came forward. On August 4th, 1972, dozens of sea mines suddenly exploded at once. These mines were in the water of Hun La, Vietnam, and were placed here to block North Vietnam for maritime trade. Soldiers stationed here of course thought a ship had hit them, but upon investigation, no ship was found. There's not much of a mystery here. There was a solar storm on the same day, and the sea mines going off were simply a result of this. We've mentioned several times now how well hidden the Viet Cong were. Through the Ho Chi Minh trails and the tunnel of the jungle as a whole, America couldn't even see their enemy for a big part of the war. General Electric put forth their solution. A backpack worn machine that would detect things like human sweat and urine and would beep. A couple things wrong with this. The first major one is the fact that this machine would often detect the sweat of the person wearing it. Then if the machine did detect someone, it would beep loudly, giving away the American soldiers' positions. These things were not used for very long at all. If we can't see people in the trees, let's just destroy the trees, some war official high on cocaine probably said. In 1968, the American army borrowed two of these massive machines to be sent to South Vietnam to clear out the dense forest to limit where the Viet Cong could hide. Agent Orange was in full swing and use by this point, and soldiers were using chainsaws and other hand tools to cut down these trees. But then these things arrived. These things weighed 60 tons and would use the brute strength to knock trees over. 
where their sharp wheels would then grind them up and break the logs. At maximum strength, a single one of these things cleared four acres of trees per hour. But these things never worked at full strength, because a big part of the day was spent pulling them out from the mud as they got stuck a lot. Also, they were easy targets, as it had no form of defense, and would be shut down by a few well-placed shots through the machine's water coolers. Suggestions for improvements were made, including putting a 50 caliber machine gun turret on top of it, but these plans never went through. Imagine this, you're in a helicopter in Vietnam, manning some massive machine gun, and you're handed these new night goggles to spot the enemy easier. You put them on and get back on your gun, but there's no enemies in the trees. They're above you, circling your helicopter. Black, shadowy demons circling in and out and around your crew. And you let into them, you start firing wildly, and your crew asks, what the hell are you shooting at? And you respond, can you not see those things? Sure enough, and saw the red night vision demons. Years later, you're given these newer goggles, and you put them on, and your vision is now green, with no demons to be seen at all. Alright, you ready to explore a rabbit hole with me? Because my friends, I fell into one with this entry. I was curious, because that story sounded interesting. I love the paranormal and cryptids, and I wanted to find the source for this origin story. I couldn't find it. My adventure took me high and low. Through a podcast discussing people being sacrificed and fed to the sky people, not kidding. And then so the Nummo can be thought of as the star people. Right. They came from the stars. And then there were these people they called the sky people. To a website that closely resembled the Riddler's website from Batman. Not this guy though, I would trust him with my life. And we have a fellow West Virginian here, what do you know? And back to my old stomping grounds TikTok. I watched video upon video about these red night vision demons and none of them provide a source. Damn it, I'll listen to you all, but you gotta cite a source. Where did this story come from? Is there a name? What I did find was the fact that these old night vision goggles were made with Dicerin dye, and the conspiracy surrounds this too, stating this was the key to seeing the paranormal and now it's banned. It's not. I want answers to this. Where did this story come from? If anyone has some further reading for me to do, please let me know. I'm interested. I don't think it's real, but hey, I'll read about it if I can find it. And now, a war that was full of clusterfucks must end on a clusterfuck. And this may be the biggest one of them all. We're at the fall of Saigon, and America is getting out. And they were taking their South Vietnamese allies with them. This included 3,300 children, both infants and orphans. This action was criticized, mostly on the fact that, as we said, not all these children were orphans, and they had living parents in South Vietnam. But morality aside, the slogan of America and the war, these children were being taken into the states and their western allies, like Germany and France. Their first group of children were placed into a plane on April 4th, 1975, and everything is fine, they're taking off and leaving. Let's just hope the lower rear fuel sage doesn't tear apart and the plane crashes into a rice field, killing 138 people. Oh god, that's exactly what happened. What a way to end the war. And here we are. I want to apologize if the order of this iceberg was weird. I knew very little of the Vietnam War. And I made this iceberg, by the way. But I was trying to fill its obscureness by my level of knowledge, so sorry if I put something too low or too high. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed the video as well as you could. We kind of got dark there a few times. If you want to follow the development of my new videos, my Discord server is the best way to see it, and it's linked in my description along with my Twitter. I don't post there, but I like seeing that number get bigger. Alright, that's enough for me. Have a wonderful day, everyone.